You know, over the course of this series, as it's been our focus this month, uh, it's been my aim for us to see prayer not as something we have to do, not as a duty, a chore, an obligation that we have to fulfill, not even as a spiritual discipline that we need to habituate in our lives as important as it is to cultivate prayer as something habitual in our life. It's been my desire that we would be captivated by a vision of what a praying life looks like, captivated by a vision of what it means for us to grow as a praying church, to see that we've been given this immense privilege in prayer, a privilege that Jesus revealed to us as us asking him for anything in his name, and he said that he would do it, which sounds absolutely mind-blowing to even contemplate, a privilege knowing that the Spirit himself intercedes for us in our weakness, as Scripture revealed to us, that we don't know what to pray for as we ought to be praying for, privilege knowing that the Spirit of God takes our weak, feeble prayers and he presents them before the throne of grace in a manner that is according to the will of God, which God has said that when we pray that way, he'll answer those prayers. A privilege knowing that you and I get to commune with our Heavenly Father in prayer. And there we can avail ourselves of the immeasurable grace of God that he has for us in Christ Jesus. Prayer is an awesome privilege, brothers and sisters. It's not something we have to do. It's something we can delight in doing. And I pray that you've been getting a sense for that uh, this month and during our time of prayer. Now, Scripture, as I've said, has a lot to teach us about prayer. The Old Testament, the New Testament, there is a lot about prayer in your Bible. And no better place for us to learn about prayer than what Jesus himself taught his disciples in the sixth chapter of Matthew. And that's where I want to spend this week and next, in this, this beautiful passage where Jesus teaches his disciples on prayer. In fact, when we come to Luke chapter 11, that is a kind of a parallel about the Lord's Prayer, we see the, the disciples themselves asking Jesus, teach us to pray. And that's exactly what Jesus does. So we're going to look at that here. But before we get to the Lord's Prayer, even though we're going to look at that in our passage today and read it, we're going to see that Jesus teaches us a couple of very important things about how to pray and how not to pray before he teaches us what to pray. So that's going to be our emphasis as we read this passage this morning. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. And today I want to focus here uh, on the emphasis Jesus places on who it is that you and I are actually praying to as he teaches us how to pray. We are praying to our Father. Matthew chapter 6, hear the words of the living God. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is the word of the Lord. Now, the context for where Jesus teaches this is arguably is his most famous sermon, right? We call it the Sermon on the Mount. And there his disciples gather unto him thousands, and he begins to teach them 
and instruct them. And especially in this passage where we find the teaching on the Lord's Prayer, we find that Jesus has been contrasting the self-righteousness of the Pharisees, their false piety, their superficial uh, religion, and he's contrasting that with what true righteousness looks like, what true piety uh, looks like and that God desires. In fact, the opening verse of this chapter, he says to them, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. That's at the heart of what Jesus is teaching in these moments. He's teaching about the giving of the religious leaders and the Pharisees in contrast to what the Lord desires of us, right? They give in order to what? Everyone's seeing what amazing givers they are. And he says, well, they have their reward. And here he talks about prayer, what they want to be seen praying in public. Well, they have their reward. Oh, and when it comes to fasting, they let everybody know they're fasting, right? They put on a real droopy face, smear a little mud on their face to look like they haven't bathed in days, right? And, and oh, I'm fasting. They want everyone to know that they've abstained from food because they're seeking the Lord. And he says, hey, because they want to be seen by everybody, well, now they have their reward. And this is at the heart of what Jesus critiques about the religious leaders and the religious system of his day. It looked right in the eyes of everyone else who was observing and watching. Wow, look how much they give. Wow, look how much they pray and how loud they pray. Wow, they're always fasting. It looks right. It looks the part, but it was all a show. It was empty religion. Why? Because their motives weren't pure. Their motives weren't right. Their motives weren't focused on God. They were focused on man and pleasing man. So their aim wasn't pleasing God. So Jesus pulls the curtain back on this charade and go, that looks, looks like the real deal, but it's not. So the first thing when we come to this aspect of his teaching on prayer is we find the Lord saying, when you pray, check your motives. When you pray. Notice he says not if you pray. The expectation of the disciples would be that they would pray. We would want to commune with God. We would want to fellowship with the Lord and in prayer. So it's not if you pray, but when you pray, there's something very important you need to consider, and that is your motives. Because it's not about technique. I think the Pharisees probably had the right technique, the right words to pray. Very eloquent speech, using a lot about the scripture, right? The law of God in their prayer. It's not about what others think about you when you pray. It is about your heart when it comes to prayer. Prayer must be approached with the right motives. And those right motives always have to be Godward, right? About pleasing the Lord, centered on him, focused on him and his glory. And in his critique of the people-pleasing, man-centered, glory-seeking prayer of the Pharisees and scribes, he's not telling us that all public prayer is wrong. Otherwise, we'd have a problem praying in public, right? We'd have a problem coming together as a church and offering prayer if what Jesus was condemning here was public prayer. He's not condemning all forms of public prayer. He's not saying they're all wrong. In fact, we have numerous examples of public prayers in the scriptures and model for us in the scriptures, so we know that's not what's after here. What he is, is that Jesus is going straight at the corrupt motivations of the religious leaders that accompanied their public displays of self-righteousness, whether it was in their giving, praying, or fasting. Now, we know that pious Jews would stop to pray three times a day, 9 a.m., noon, and at 3. Wherever they were at those appointed times of prayer, as their tradition said, they would stop and pray. Sometimes they would find themselves in a public place to pray. Now, most Jews would, pious Jews would say, you know, let me just retreat somewhere to to discreetly offer my prayers unto the Lord. But if they were in a public place, they could still pray in public, but many of them would do it in a way that kind of wasn't pointing attention at themselves in prayer. So Jesus isn't talking about that. What he's addressing here is now those who would find themselves in a public place And when they came to praying in public, they would do it in a way that was calling attention to themselves. 
their motivations for praying in public was to be seen by others, to impress others, for others to take notice of how spiritual they were, right? And Jesus says, well, if you're going to do it with those motivations, then you had better enjoy that moment because you're getting all out of prayer in that moment that you are expecting. You want the applause of men, the praise of men, impress men? Well, you got that. Enjoy it because that's all you're going to get. There's not going to be any reward from the Father. There's not going to be any eternal reward from your prayer. Well, the way the religious leaders prayed was in order to boost their reputations. They were performing not for God, not for the audience of one, but for a human audience, right? They wanted the praises of men. Uh, William Barclay in his commentary notes that the Jewish system of prayer made ostentation very easy because the way they would pray would be standing with arms outstretched with their palms upward and their head bowed. So you can imagine these religious people, these self-righteous people coming out and doing that, right? Stretching out their arms with their palms up and praying as loud as they can pray so that everyone could hear them and applaud their piety. So Jesus isn't condemning public prayer. He's not even condemning standing in prayer as they're praying in public. Scripture tells us there's a lot of different postures one can take in prayer. Sitting, kneeling, standing, bowing down, even laying yourself prostrate on the ground. It's not about the posture. It's about the motives of the heart. And the issue Jesus is getting at here is the temptation that can accompany public prayer. Why? It's all about the heart. You and I, and the propensity of our hearts is to twist our motives for prayer when we pray publicly so that we are now crafting our words and using specific words, right, to to move people or to get or elicit a response from people. Like it or not, we crave, right, flattery. We want it. We like our egos being stroked. So when it comes to public prayer, he's like, you got to watch your heart. What is your motivations for doing it? Because if they're not pure, if it is about pleasing men, then you'll have your reward. You've, You've got what you wanted, but that's all you'll ever get out of it. If any of our motives are twisted that way to generate a response from others, we are no longer praying to please God. We are pleasing man. We want to be seen by men rather than by God. And he's saying that's like praying just like the hypocrites. They're feigning devotion to God when their true aim is to be seen by men. Now, that's a big problem in our social media world of today. You know, there's a pastor that I've followed for years. I've, I, I, he's an acquaintance. I, I know him. He's not in this state. He's somewhere else. But I've been following him for years and watching you know, his ministry grow and expand. And he's got a super thriving uh, church. But he's always posting pictures of himself praying, whether it's at the chair before a service or even at the altar, right? I don't know if he if he um, coaches his church photographers to kind of capture these images. But he's posting them on his own personal page and talking about how he's always praying, you know, for the church and praying for the people and taking those times to pray. Now, I really don't like that as it is because it kind of, (laughs) these passages kind of speak against that. But reading the comments from people, right? Oh, pastor so-and-so. Man, it's, I just love how you're always praying for us. Oh, man, I've just, that you're such a man of prayer. What an example. And I sit here and I think how dangerous that is for his soul. How dangerous that is for us who like to be stroked. Like for people to see us as more spiritual. We already have that as a temptation as pastors. We want people to think, wow, look how spiritual and amazing they are. It's amazing they don't float off the ground. And here he is just posing about, look at, look at me, you know, <laughs> kneeling at my chair before the presence of God. But how many people do that, right? Taking pictures with their open Bible all marked up. Look at me. 
Oh, I love my quiet times with the Lord every day, every morning. Or our pictures of worship, right? The, always the pictures of our, of our services are about, oh, look at everybody worshiping God with their hands of praise. We like that. We already crave that. Our sinful hearts desire it. And Jesus say, watch out. Watch out, because if you're doing this for others, if you're doing this for the praise of man, well, you've got it, but that's all you're getting. The hypocrite gets their full reward right here and now. They have the applause of men. They grow the positive reputations they're seeking from others. They, they, they get the positive acclaim they long for and desire, the worldly recognition, but that's it, no eternal Reward. So Jesus presents the alternative solution to that of the hypocrites. The alternative solution to keep us from being tempted by public prayer. And the first part of that is we're to pray in secret. He says, don't pray like them. Don't pray like that. Pray like this. He says, when you go to your room, shut the door. Shut the door. Keep out the devil. Shut the door in the secret place and get with God because your audience is your father who is in secret, who sees you and who will reward you. That's amazing, isn't it? Now, the houses of Jesus' day at the, in, that, in that time, right, there was usually a storeroom in the interior portion of the house where things were kept, and that was a windowless room, Right? So it's not like anybody could be peeking in and seeing you, right? This, this wasn't a storeroom, like a closet, if you will, like a pantry. And Jesus is saying, go in there and shut that door and there pray. Pray in secret. Why? I think there's great wisdom in that, isn't there? In light of what Jesus is saying, right? Pray that way so you won't be corrupted by the, the impure motives, right, of the hypocrites, Pray this way so that you'll remove any temptation to pray pray in a manner so as to be seen by others, for others to take notice of what you are doing. If your aim is pleasing God in prayer, well, if you do this, then you won't be tempted to put on a religious show for worldly rewards. Jesus is saying, look, in prayer, here's the place where you don't have to perform. You got to perform everywhere else, don't you? You got to perform at your job. You got to perform in your relationships with others. You got to perform in so many things. But when it comes to prayer, that's, it's not about performance, isn't it? Don't pray to impress others. You don't even need to pray to impress God. Guess why? Because you can't. <laughs> there ain't nothing impressive about you. There's nothing impressive about me. What could you impress God with in prayer? Your eloquence, your right framing of words, nope. Your own righteousness, nope. You ain't got none of that. So he's saying, go, go, close the door. Don't put on a show for anyone else because you really, you can't fool God. That's the one place you really can be honest. That's the one place you really can pour your heart out. And there you won't be tempted to, to, to do this for others so they think anything of you. God already knows your heart. God already knows. He's there in the secret. He's seeing you. He knows you better than you know yourself. And there, pray to your heavenly Father who sees you and will reward you. Pray in secret to honor God. And even if you do pray in public, even if we're praying, we're going to be praying in small groups again at, after the message here. It's not to perform for others to see or be impressed by how we pray. We're doing it to please God, to honor Him, and to bring glory to Him. It means we don't need to announce to others that we're going to pray. We don't have to tell others how often we pray. We don't even have to tell other people how long we pray. Don't post about it. I mean that. Check your hearts every time you feel like you've got to show people your Religious devotion. You don't need to do that. When you do that for the praises of men, you'll get it. You'll get a little heart like. You might grow an extra follower. You might get a nice comment. Oh, what an example. You are mighty man or woman of God. But that's it. 
And Jesus says, don't do it for that. You'll get an earthly reward, but that's the extent of it. Go to that closet. Close the door. Don't let others see you. Go with the right motivation to please the Lord, to honor him, to a place of spiritual intimacy with your father. Which that's the second part. You're praying in secret, but you're praying to your father. It is the goal of secret prayer to shut out all other distractions and remove the temptations of public prayer to go before your heavenly father to pray to that audience of one. So Jesus says, when that's your motivation to seek him, to please him, the father who is there with you sees you and rewards you. See, this is the promise of scripture that God does not withhold himself from those who seek him. Psalm 27, 8, you have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's what happens when we pray to our Father in secret. Enter into prayer with the heart that longs for God and his presence. Seek him, pray to him, present your requests before him, confess your sins before him, lean on the righteousness of Christ in prayer. And Jesus is saying, when you do that, he's there in secret with you. You're not alone. You're not praying to the air. You're not praying into the ether, right? You're praying. And the God of the universe who is your loving father, sees you, hears you, and will reward you. What does that reward encompass? How does the father reward you? I have not prayed and seen a pot of gold appear in front of me. It's not that. We'd do a lot of praying if it was that, wouldn't we? <laughs> no. How does he reward you? Well, Jesus doesn't say how he rewards you. He doesn't give us... Anything here, at least in this passage, but it's not hard to guess how he rewards us in light of all the things that Scripture teaches us concerning prayer. The first and greatest way the Lord rewards us is with himself. It is with himself. He rewards you with himself. We always tend to think of reward as a something, don't we? Not as a someone. But the someone is the greatest reward, the greatest blessing you and I could ever hope to have in prayer. To enjoy the sweet fellowship and presence of God and delight in Him is the greatest reward we could have. Psalm 68, uh, 65, 4, Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We are blessed, brothers and sisters. There's no greater blessing than seeking the Lord and being with Him in prayer and knowing He sees us and is with us and he gives of himself to us. What greater blessing is there to receive than to receive the blessing of God himself? There isn't one. There isn't one. Psalms 1611, in his presence we find fullness of joy at his right hand or pleasures, in his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Do you see prayer that way? Do you see spending time with God and seeking his face as that as joy? As Pleasure, this is how we ought to see it because it is what it is. So that's one of the ways he rewards us. A second way is exactly that. He rewards us with answered prayer. When we started this series talking about that, answered prayer is the default. It is not the exception, it is the rule. And we can get into a very pessimistic mode of praying where we think, Oh, God is just reluctant to answer our prayers. And we've got, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. We've got, we got to kind of coerce him into answering our prayers. No. Jesus says, when you enter into the secret place of that, of prayer with God in secret, not for the applause of men, not for the acclaim of men, but to please God for his honor and his glory, he sees us and he rewards us. He doesn't say he might reward you. Jesus said, ask anything in my name and I will maybe possibly do it. 
Oh, he will do it. He rewards with answered prayer. Now, the way the hypocrites were praying ensured that their prayers certainly would never be answered. Because they weren't seeking the pleasure of God and to please God and to honor him. So when we pray with the wrong motives, not to please him and to impress others, then we can be assured our prayers will not prevail. But when we offer sincere prayer, as we've been talking about, prayer offered in faith in the name of Jesus, with the aim being the glory of God, God hears those prayers and he answers them. Do you believe that? Do you? Then pray like it's true, because it is. We're not praying seeking for our own glory. We're seeking his glory alone. And he says he'll reward us with answered prayer. A third way he rewards you is with a heart change. It's with a heart change. And it's a heart change that is more aligned with his heart. And I love this. Prayer doesn't only change circumstances. Prayer doesn't always change things. Prayer changes us. Prayer does something in us that that few things can do. It's a work of the Spirit. It's a work of grace. It's a work of His Word. But there's a transformation that happens in our heart in sincere prayer. God works in us to change our affections, to change our desires, so much so that they become more aligned with His. We like to quote the Scripture, right? God will give you the desires of your heart. Well, if my heart isn't aligned with His, I don't want those desires because those desires are going to destroy me. But if my desires are aligned with His desires, if what my heart wants are the things that are in God's heart and the things that He desires, don't you think He's going to give us all of those things? Of course He is. Of course He is. And this happens in prayer. The Word of God, the Spirit of God work to conform our will and our heart to His. I said it in, I said it in the first part of our series, right? Jesus said in John 14, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you'll ask whatever you wish in my name, and I will do it. In communing with Christ and having His Word live and take residence in our heart, we begin to desire the things that God desires. We want to do the things that please the heart of God. And as we're asking in accordance to the will of God, He will do all of those things. Now, He says to pray in the secret place. Does that mean I need to create a prayer closet? <laughs> a few years ago, there was that, oh man, what's the name of that movie? Um, what was it? War Room. Remember that? Oh, you need to have you have a war room. You need to create yourself a little prayer closet, right? Put a little pillow on the floor, right? So your tushy's comfortable or your knees don't hurt. And make sure there's a Bible in there. And put some scriptures on the wall. And pray some nice music in the background. And pray there. Tarry in prayer there. Do a spiritual warfare there. Do you really need to do that? No, that's not what Jesus is saying. Guess what? We can pray whenever and wherever. Now, If you have a special place to pray because you know it's distraction-free and all that, that's cool. I'm not saying don't do that. This is not a prescription to not do that. But Jesus is not prescribing here that that's what you must do. The point is, what are your motivations? What is driving you in prayer? Is it for the acclaim of others and to impress others or to please God? And so he's saying it's better to go into the secret place. Go where no one can see you. Don't tell people. Don't make a show of your prayer. This isn't about performing for other people. This is seeking God and getting alone with God. What matters is the motives of your heart. And what a glorious privilege we've been given to pray to our Father who is in secret, trusting that he sees and hears us, and he will reward us. So when you pray, check your motives. But then the next portion here, he's telling us when we pray to check also our methods. Verse 7, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Right? So, he's telling the disciples, when you pray, don't pray like the hypocrites do. But then he adds this other one here. And to illustrate this, he doesn't use 
the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious leaders of his time, he draws an illustration from the way the pagans pray, the Gentiles pray. And and this is the illustration he gives us there. When they pray, here's how they do it. That's not the way to do it. Now, who are the Gentiles? That's any non-Jewish person, right? And these would be typically worshiping all of the false gods and all of the pagan uh, pagan gods. They weren't praying to the God of Israel like the Jews were praying. In fact, they did not know the God of Israel. But when they pray, he says, they heap up empty phrases. Some translations say they, they don't, they, they, he's telling you, don't babble like the Gentiles. The King James says, do not use vain repetitions like the heathens do. That phrase that the ESV translates as heap up empty phrases or vain, don't use vain repetitions is a very interesting Greek word. In fact, it's a very rare word. It's, it's found in very few sources outside of the New Testament. Uh, the word in the Greek is onomatopoetic, right? That's when a, 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 the word, the pronunciation of a word, right, illustrates the way it sounds, right? Now, our English word babble is like that. When we talk about people babbling, what are we talking about? They're stuttering or murmuring things in an incomprehensible, unintelligible way, right? They're just, just babbling on and on, we talk about, right? Or when we hear someone speaking in a foreign language that we don't know or understand, it sounds like babble to us. It doesn't make sense to us, all right? Or we talk about how a little baby babbles, right? They're repeating some sound or some gurgling sound over and over again where you want to just kind of put on your headphones and tune it out, right? We call that babbling. Well, this word is exactly what he says the pagans are doing, praying to their false God's, it is incomprehensible, unintelligible, stuttering, foolish talk, foolish words repeated over and over again. And with it in mind is about mindless repetition. The pagans, when they pray, they mindlessly repeat chants or mantras over and over again or mutter over and over again a particular sound. Okay, that's what he's talking about here. And Jesus says, not only do they mindlessly repeat things, they use a lot of words, many words he talks about here. And they do that thinking that the more words they use, the more they pray, the longer they pray, well then, God is going to hear me now, or the gods are going to respond to my request. If I repeat the right words in the right amounts, the gods must respond. And he's saying, that's how the pagans, the pagans pray, but not you. Now, we see that in a lot of false religions and cultish practices, don't we? In their forms of prayer. The Hindu practices of prayer and meditation are about what? Repeating chants and mantras and words and sounds over and over again for extended periods of time. Much of Muslim prayer ritual and practice is the same thing. Repeating prayer formulas and phrases over and over again. Sometimes for hours. We see that in New Age spiritualism and practices, right, of the repetition of certain sounds or phrases to get into a meditative state, to empty one's mind and to open oneself to the universe, right? And it's done not for a few minutes, but for hours sometimes, right? That's, That's what he has in view here. Now, we see a couple of examples that come to mind in Scripture. Remember in 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah's battle with the prophets of Baal? What happened there was the prophets of Baal, right? It was their turn to go first, right? In the battle of the gods, the God of Israel and, 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 and Baal worshipers. And the prophets of Baal, what do they do? They pray for half a day, and they're repeating the same phrase over and over again. Oh, Baal, answer us. And they were working themselves up in a frenzy, chanting this. And they'd even cut themselves and, and bleed all over the place in the hopes that their God would hear them and respond. And, of course, the false God cannot do that. We see this in Acts 19. In Acts 19, we see the powerful preaching of the gospel from Paul and the ministry team there uh, at Ephesus. And it, and it was so impactful that it enraged the worshipers and devotees of Artemis. And so what they do is incite a riot, and they chant for over two hours. They're ch- and chanting great is Artemis of the Ephesians, right? They were doing the same thing, repeating this phrase over and over again. That's kind of how we see 
false worship, false, false prayer. And that is very distinct from the approach to prayer that Jesus is teaching his disciples here. He's saying, don't do that. And the reason is, you, our God is not like those gods. Our God, the one we pray to, is not some impersonal God who has to be coerced, manipulated, pestered through the repetition of empty phrases in order to do our bidding and our will. That's how the pagans pray. That's their view of prayer. But that's not ours. We're not praying to a God that can be manipulated through, through chance and through the recitation of mantras. We are praying to the sovereign God of the universe, who, by the way, is also our Father. We're praying to our Father who knows what we need and who cares for us. Well, that's very different, isn't it? Very different. Now, it's important to note that just like Jesus was not prohibiting the public expression of prayer because the hypocrites had wrong motives, he's also not prohibiting length of prayers here or even repeating words in prayer, okay, just because of the misguided prayer of the pagans, right? We, we have examples of Jesus actually praying for a long time, don't we? Luke's gospel tells us he prayed through the night. How many of us have done that? Jesus himself went to desolate places to pray for extended periods of time. I'd imagine he was teaching his disciples to do the very same things, okay? Um, And in the Psalms, we see the use of repeated phrases sometimes, don't we? Like Psalm 136, where the phrase, his steadfast love endures forever, is repeated after every other line. So what's going on here? Is, Is Jesus condemning the use of long prayers or praying for a long time or repeated phrases? Again, of course not. But it is interesting to note that overall, the repetitions of words and phrases in Scripture is actually used very sparingly. It's almost like he's cautioning in a way against it. And what he's prohibiting here is something you and I all need to be aware of so we don't fall into the same error concerning our methods of praying. Because the method of the pagans here was repeated, empty phrases, right? Mindless repetition and lots of words. The more I say, the more I pray, the longer I pray, God has to hear and respond. Well, Jesus makes it clear here, first of all, that we do not pray to inform God. Did you know that? When you pray, you are not telling God something that he does not know. When you ask God for something, it's not like God's going, man, I didn't know he needed that. I didn't, I really didn't know she, she needed that thing. Where have I been? <laughs> what have I been doing? We're not praying to inform God. Jesus makes it clear our Father knows what you and I need before we open, open our mouth to ask. He's not unaware. He's not unconcerned. He's not distant and removed. And again, he's certainly not ignorant. So let me ask you, when you present your request to God, do you pray as if you're informing him of something that he does not already know? Again, it's about the way we view God, the way we think of him. Notice, again, the repeated use of Jesus's your father, your father, your father. A good father generally knows what his kids need before they even ask for those things. And we do that as imperfect, flawed parents, don't we? Dads, we kind of suck at this many times. But generally, we have an idea. We know our kids may have a need of something. And sometimes they'll come and ask us of those things, and we're like, yeah, I know. I know you need that. And we'll try to give it to them. But we have something far greater than that. We have a heavenly father who's the God of this universe. Who provides all things and can supply all things that we have need of. And he knows before we even ask, before we even know it's a need in our life, he already knows. So don't be like the pagans who think they're telling their God something that they don't know. He already knows before you even get there. We also do not pray to persuade God. The pagans pray 
because they're trying to twist their God's arm. Their God is reluctant. In fact, many of the gods of the pagans are cruel. So they've got to do a lot of things to try to persuade them to do their bidding, to, 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 to do the things that they're asking them to do. But Jesus is saying, that's, that's not our father. Those gods are not personal gods. Those gods are not loving gods. Those gods have to be battered by many words and repeated phrases so that they'll eventually, or you hope they'll do what you want. That's not the God of this universe. That is not our father. He doesn't need to be battered with many words, right, so that you'll be persuaded. Now, how many of you as children, your children might do this to you now, right? They ask you over and over again for something, and you've told them no, and no, and no, but they don't stop because over and over again, they keep asking you for that toy or that thing. And what happens? Sometimes they wear you down, don't they? And you relent. Why? Because you, you don't want to hear it anymore. Like, shut up already. I'll get that for you. <laughs> That's not our God. He doesn't respond that way. So we don't pray trying to, uh, the, more, the more I ask for this thing, he's just going to have to. Because he's going to get really tired of hearing me. Now, I know we may not have verbalized that, but I know many of us have probably prayed that way. I'll confess. There are periods of my life I've prayed like that, thinking, well, he's going to have to do it because I'm not going to stop asking. Now, you go, well, doesn't Jesus tell us to persist in prayer? Isn't there such a thing as persistent prayer? Sure is. We'll talk about that next week or the week after. But that's not what Jesus has in view here. That's not what he's talking about here. It's having the wrong view about who God is, the wrong view about our Father and how he responds to our prayer. Do you feel that when you pray that the Father must be pestered and that you must frequently repeat things in the hopes that all of those incessant requests will one day be met with answered prayer? Jesus says, don't pray like that. Another thing the pagans do and that we must not do is we must not pray to manipulate God. See, for the pagans, they thought that their, the phrases they used, the words they used, the sounds they would make had some kind of magical power infused in them that caused the gods to respond or to do. You know, we talked a little bit about that with the phrase in Jesus' name. Some people use that. They love to tag that at the end of the prayer because they think that's the secret key to unlock the heart of God to respond in prayer, and it's not. We don't pray to manipulate God with the right words, to saying the right things or the right amount of things so that he will act. Don't pray like that, Jesus says, because you can't manipulate God. There's no right way to formulate words for God to go, ooh, he said the magic phrase. (laughs) He used abracadabra, I got to do it now. Oh, he said in Jesus' name, I have no choice now. We don't pray that way. I know this is kind of funny, but we kind of do these things, right? And that's why Jesus is warning his disciples. And we also do not pray to obligate God. Now, in the pagans' view of prayer, the repetition of phrases and the many words was seen as a meritorious work. The longer they prayed... The longer they repeated these phrases, their God is obligated to answer because they are jumping every hurdle of prayer. They're going through every prayer hoop they have to go through. Their God must be respond. It has to happen. And we may have that view of prayer sometimes as well. If I pray enough, man, if I, if I, man, if I, just, if I just get into the habit of praying every day for 30 minutes, If I keep praying for this thing over and over again, God has to do it because look how much I'm praying. Jesus is warning against that. Sometimes we view prayer like the pagans. I know we don't mean to. You might even have the gospel right in many things, but when it comes to prayer, we kind of can get twisted up here. And then we're praying like this, frantically repeating requests because we don't want God to forget. I got to keep reminding him of this. I don't want him to forget. Well, our earthly parents may forget. I may forget as a dad something my daughter's asked me about or says she's needed. God doesn't forget. 
We frantically wait, seek to persuade him because we don't honestly view him as the loving father who cares for us. So we got to keep coming back in prayer. Or we feel that God has to answer our request because of the amount of time we're putting into prayer. God, don't you see? I'm not watching my favorite show anymore. I'm not spending as much time on social media. I'm setting this part of time for you, Lord. I'm consecrating this time of prayer. You have to answer me. I can't tell you how many times as a pastor over the years I've had people come to me, you know, wondering why God hasn't answered their prayers because they have been praying a long time about something. And and, and the heart behind that is, isn't God obligated to answer me? I'm praying. I'm doing what he's telling me to do. I got news for you. God is not obligated to answer your prayer. No human can put God under obligation. You can't earn God's obligation. You can't do it. God is not going to be obligated by us. He's not obligated to honor our prayer efforts. He cannot be obligated by our many words or phrases or repeated prayer requests to to respond in a way to them. That he answers prayer is what? Out of his grace because he's a loving father. Not because you put in the time to pray. Do you understand that? Does that make sense to you? And we got to be careful we're not praying that way sometimes. Because we've just got some twisted view of him as our father, of what he's like or he's not like, that is contrary to how he's revealed himself to us. Jesus tells us, you don't pray like that. Because our God is not like the God of the pagans. Your God is not some force to manipulate. He's not an impersonal deity, some cosmic power to bend to our will. Man, he's your father. He's your father. He's fully aware. He knows. He cares. He's concerned about your situation. He truly is, brothers and sisters. He is concerned, and he cares. And before you even utter your request, Jesus says he already knows what you need. All right, so if that's true, then how are we supposed to pray? How are we supposed to pray? Well, let me give you some things that I think will help you in that area. Okay, he already knows what we need before we ask. So how should we pray? Well, our prayer and any request that we utter before God should always be prayed to our Father, expressing our complete dependence upon him. Nowhere am I telling you that God doesn't want to hear your laundry list of needs. Okay, he does. He cares about them. But why do we bring our needs to him in the first place? Why do we present our request? Why does he invite us to do that? Why does Jesus invite us to ask anything in his name and he will do it? Because our asking and our prayer is again an expression of our trust and dependence on God as the only one who can supply our needs who can provide for us, who can do the very thing we are asking him to do. It's not to inform him. It's not to coerce him. It's not to manipulate him into that thing. It's to say, God, I know you're the only one who can do this. God, you are the source of my daily bread, which is why you tell me to ask for my daily bread, the daily provision that I need because you're my father and you love to provide those things for us. Presenting our needs to God is praying out of our conviction that we are dependent upon him for the very things we are seeking him for. This is why we pray, and this is how we should pray. All prayer is an expression of dependence on God through our requests. If it's not, then I don't know why you're praying. Typically, we don't pray for the things that we can do of ourselves. We don't praying, God, I'd like to buy uh, some Coke Zero um, when I can just go to the store and get that. No, we come to God saying, Lord, you're the one who provides for my needs. Remember Jesus in, in telling you, don't be anxious for anything. Don't be anxious. Why? Your heavenly father knows what you have need of, and he cares, and he's providing. Well, when I come to him in prayer, I'm acknowledging that. 
you are the source of all good things. You're the source of everything that I need. I'm wholly dependent on you. And not only that, because he knows what I need before I ask, I can pray in faith and cast my cares upon my heavenly father. Prayer is an act of faith. We believe God is willing to hear our prayer and grant the things that we request. That's why we go to him with our needs. We go to him when we're weary. We go to him when we're anxious about life. We go to him when we're, we're, we're concerned about the souls of our children. We go to him when we have difficulty in financial needs. We go to him about a challenge or our job situation. We, we go to him about a conflict in relationship. We, we go to him about a decision that we need to make and that is weighing heavy on our heart. We go to him with our fears about the future. We go to him with every expression of desire that we have to live holy and pleasing lives before God. And we go to him when we have failed him and we've sinned against him and need to avail ourselves of the righteousness of Christ and the forgiveness that we have in him. We take all of our fears and all of our concerns and all of our anxious longings and all of our desires and all of our needs and all of our hopes. And what do we do? We place them in the hands of our loving Heavenly Father. We cast our cares upon Him. We lay our burdens at His feet. You and I are not informing someone who is forgetful. We're not trying to persuade someone who is reluctant to grant our request. We're not putting into obligation an uncaring deity who is keeping score, and we're not trying to manipulate some impersonal force. I love how Martin Luther wrote about prayer, that prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance, but laying hold of his willingness. And I love that phrase because our prayer many times is like that. God does not want to give me the thing I want. God's not answering my prayer. And so we're praying like he's reluctant and he's unwilling and he's not. He's not at all. He's our heavenly father. And the thing is, he knows what's best for us. He knows what we have need of more than ourselves. And as, I, as I've said before in our series here, thank God he doesn't answer some things according to the way we've prayed them. But he does answer every prayer according to his will. And this is why we have the Spirit interceding for us. When we pray, we are pouring our hearts out to our loving and caring Father, and he promises to answer when we pray in this fashion, like a child to his father. Dads, what wouldn't you give your kids when they ask you things, right? If you could, you'd give them everything. Out of what? Your love, your heart. And I don't mean things that are destructive for them, right? I mean th- everything for their benefit, for their thriving, for their flourishing, for their enjoyment in life. Well, how much more our Heavenly Father desires those things for us and says He'll reward us and give us those things. We talk to Him by faith, believing that He is able to take care of all those things that are heavy upon our hearts. What is your need today? What is the petition you've presented before God? Check your motives, check your methods. But believe what Jesus is saying about our Father. Your Father, your Father, your Father, who sees in secret, who sees you, He will reward you. Your Father knows what you have need of before you ask it. How will He not graciously give you all things in Christ Jesus out of His love for you in Christ? This is the whole of the emphasis of Jesus' teaching on prayer. You're praying to your Father. You're speaking to your Father. Your Father delights to hear from you. It's not an obligation. It's not a chore. It's not a heavy work that that prayer is to engage in. Speak to Him from your heart. 
Pour out your heart before him. Share with him all of your concerns. Lay your burdens upon him, for he cares for you. You don't need fancy words. You you don't need to to, to rightly frame all of your words, and and, and that's how, that's what's going to make him hear you. You don't need to recite a prayer formula. You don't have to repeat things to him over and over again like he's deaf. He's not reluctant. He's not unconcerned. He's your father, and he is willing and able. All Jesus is saying here is pray with the right motives. Pray with a heart inclined to please God, to glorify God, to honor God, to serve God. Pray in a manner consistent with the character and nature of who he is, Christ of Christ. That's why we pray in his name. And pray with confidence that he hears you, and he will answer you. So how long should you pray? Well, pray with as much fervor, length, and intensity as is necessary until you emerge from the secret place of prayer, fully convinced that he sees you, he hears you, and he'll reward and answer you. Why? Because he is your father.